I'm going to thank everybody for being here, first of all. Um, this is a little bit of a dream come true for myself. Um, uh, I'll give you a bit of uh, background on myself before we start a discussion here. So, um, uh, I grew up in a family where my father was an engineer and my mother was a classical Indian singer. And uh, today, uh, I never thought I would be like either of them. I, I just, you know, uh, today I'm a um, digital journalist and a creative director. Um, I talk a little too. Um, this, this evening came together because a few months ago uh, I got a chance uh, to interview uh, Nigel Lockyer, who you'll hear more from this evening. And um, he is a remarkable man who uh, is a director of Triumph. And uh, he can tell you more about Triumph. Uh, and uh, when, I did that, when I did that interview, um, we, put it, we put it online and I got, to, I got to learn a little bit more about science in our community. Um, in, our, uh, in our backyard at UBC. And I've, I've probably visited, attended many social events at UBC and never knew about this amazing place that land, sits on 14 acres out there. So if you ever get a chance, um, please do get a chance to visit and take a tour of this remarkable place. Um, so I, I, I got a chance to talk to um, communications marketing person Tim uh, Meyer, who's not here tonight. Um, but. And I said, I've got big ideas. I've got, I've got grandiose ideas on what I'm going to do. I'm graduating from my master's, and I want to lead discussions with interesting people. And um, he goes, well, Nigel's very interesting, and we should do something <laughs> with Nigel. And I go, so that's the science side. That's the science side. So we're sitting in uh, this amazing facility. And I mean, um, if you knew what, was, what, what goes on in this room here, it's the motion caption theater. Um, some remarkable work happens in here from a digital 3D perspective. Um, and my good friend here, um, Ron Burnett, who's the Vice Chancellor and President of, and did I, did I get that right, of Emily Carter? That's your title, yeah. Um, I got a chance to. It's on the slide. It's on the slide, yeah. I, I don't let my, my eyes gaze, yeah. Um, I, I got to meet him um, very recently as well and uh, speak to him on a few occasions about, uh, about tonight and about art and science. And um, we made this happen, all of us. And uh, tonight, uh, with a select few of, uh, uh, of great people who um, have helped uh, organize this event from a digital perspective, from an organizational perspective, and a communications perspective, um, we are here tonight. And I thank you all for being here tonight, too. So um, I'm going to start the discussion. And uh, if everybody's settled in and ready to go, um, tonight is about art, science, and uh, curiosity of my own, and um, I get to sit between these two remarkable men and maybe just be a fly on the wall about their, about their lives and, uh, and their perspectives. So um, I'm going to start with, uh, with Ron, and I'm going to ask you, what brought you into the art, arts world, and where did, you, where, where did your path start from? Is it hot in here? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the transformer uh, died, so the air conditioning is off. So I think we better open those doors, even though it'll be a bit of noise. Yeah, because yeah. it's going to get too hot. So that's where I start, very practically. <laughs> um, I, uh, I I cannot remember a moment in my own life when I haven't been involved in some sort of interaction with creative process. Uh, and I mean that quite literally. Uh, I was born in London, in uh, London, England after the war, and um, in a quite deprived uh, context. And I can remember in, when I was very young, basically just playing with things, trying to build things and so on. But the key moment that actually confirmed for me that art was part of my life, and I should add writing as part of my life as well, um, was a moment when I, it's a strange moment, I, I was, uh, my parents had made the unbelievable error of moving to the suburbs of Montreal where we emigrated to from England. And I was looking down through to the basement of this terrible, terrible house that I hated. And I looked down and for a split second, which has stayed for me for the, with me for the rest of my life, I sort of saw what it meant to see with your eyes. No, no, I, I need to explain that. Like in, in, in this instant, I sort of felt as if I was looking at my eyes looking. It was a meta moment on reflection. And 
that told me a story, uh, and, and, I, and it repeated for me many times afterwards as a memory, told me a story about sight. And from, from that story of seeing and what seeing is and why we see like we see and how we see like we see, uh, I essentially became completely and utterly fetishized on cameras and images. And I still have some of the cameras from that period, uh, single eight, super eights, you name, whatever I could get my hands onto. I still have a, a lot of the Super 8 films, which I'm slowly transferring and digitizing. Uh, so the, this, this, the, the, the context of art and creativity the, is not something that I, I live just simply as an intellectual pursuit. Uh, I live it within the fibers of my being. I, anytime I'm looking at something, I'm seeing it through those lenses, both past and present, and to some degree future. Uh, and it's allowed me, and that's the, the point about the heat in this room and the pragmatism of me being pissed off that the transformer is broken, um, is that it's, it's always framed by the pragmatic. So what do you do with what you know? What do you do with what you see? How do you make what you see into something that you feel? How do you take your feelings, translate them into something that can be viewed, that can be seen, that can be understood, therefore communication? And I'll make one other comment and then let Sherad take over, which is that uh, when I sort of did my undergraduate degree at McGill, um, I proposed to uh, a person who was very, very important to, my, to me in my, in my life at that time that I would I'd like to do a master's, but I'd like to make a film for a master's. So McGill University, perhaps significantly more conservative than UBC, um, you know, this was a real twist of the head. What do you mean a film for a master's degree? You've got to write something. And uh, I think for the first time in my life, I faced the problem that many artists face, which is the dominance of a certain kind of discourse that requires a certain kind of explanation. And we'll get into this in, uh, during the course of this evening. For processes that are not necessarily and shouldn't necessarily be reduced to discourse. Uh, and sometimes things need to be kept away from language just to come back to language with a, a greater degree of understanding. So I did make a film for the Masters, the first and probably one of the last. And uh, the funny part of the story is that when I submitted it, um, the uh, then Dean of Music, who was one of the examiners, and then the head of the National Film Board at the time was one of the examiners. Um, when I submitted it, uh, the Dean of Music didn't like it because I had a whole bunch of black sections in it. I was into Jean-Luc Godard, and I wanted to hit the spectator. So it was black. And he came back with this wonderful comment, film is not about darkness. And I responded by saying it's about light and dark. And we got into this debate. He wouldn't let it pass, so I called a friend of mine. And I said, I need some footage to put into this dark black stuff. I'll just edit it in, and I'll give it to him. He gave me some of the most horrific Vietnamese torture footage you could imagine. I cut it in, and I got an A. But the funny part of the story is, that for 25 years it sat in the dean's office because McGill didn't know what to do with it. They didn't have any means of archiving it. Hmm. It sat there, I came back 25 years later, it was on the uh, same filing cabinet it had been on for 25 years. And it, uh, it was rusty and faded, but it still does exist. So in answer, to, a long-winded answer to your question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a life of creativity. Sure. I, I, you know, I, so I did a, I did a mini documentary for my masters, and I, uh, I remember the process. Not so many black parts in there, the dark parts, but um, I, there's always a technical side to creativity, um, and as I mentioned, you know, coming from a family where there's engineering, and then there's a, my mother is an Indian singer, and those are the two worlds that I had. So there's a polar opposite, or somewhat that uh, that I first thought because we'll go into the discussion of the similarities of art and science, but let's talk about science, Nigel. What's your background in, uh, in science, and um, how did you get to sit here next to me, where you are today? Which suburb did you grow up in? Yeah, that's right. Which <laughs> suburb? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I thought I would start by saying that everything works at Triumph, including the air conditioning, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's a big spinning thing, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I got into science... Um, at some point, I guess I would say high school. My high school uh, grade 11 physics teacher was uh, very influential with me. He was an engineer, not a physics physicist. 
and uh, he, he motivated a lot of people in the class and, and uh, I think my first interest uh, when I realized I was interested in physics was uh, nuclear physics because that was the, the hot thing back then. Maybe it is right now for some people. And uh, it was the, the idea that you could uh, understand the world in terms of very small things. And so it was that uh, idea that there was actually a bunch of bricks that you could uh, assemble everything out of, whether it was people or buildings or the universe, sort of captured my imagination. And, and even at that time, I was uh, uh, leaning towards uh, nothing in particular. I would say I was interested in business. I was interested in biology. Uh, but uh, there was always this, this, this pull of physics that, uh, you know, ultimately physicists think they understand everything and they understand how the world works and so I thought that was quite a, quite a good position to be in. Yeah, master of the universe. Master of the universe, yeah. I got a chance to, I mean, when I was at Triumph, there's a lot of smart people at Triumph. I was feeling smart by association, as I said, but... Um, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick to my day job. Um, what I was fascinated by was uh, the many uh, amazing things that you do there. And I wanted to allude to, uh, because people just think uh, of, uh, of Triumph as just maybe a, a thing at UBC, nuclear something. But let's talk about some of the work that you guys do. And, and, and we can also allude to the agreement with India that we, oh. that we just uh, witnessed as well. So if you want to talk about some of the work that you do at Triumph. Sure. So. Uh... Triumph is a, an accelerator lab, so uh, the first thing I was explaining to Ron today when we were walking around was the difference between an electric field and a magnetic field. An electric field accelerates charged particles and a magnetic field contains them, so you can direct them. Think of one as steering and one as accelerating. So Triumph is an accelerator lab that uses accelerators and, and the technology associated with accelerators to do science and the, the main focus of the science at Triumph uh, proper, I'll say, because Triumph has a role nationally and it has a role locally. So if, if you go and visit and you ask what is it we do, I would say the primary question we're, we're asking is what is the origin of the chemical elements? So the chemical elements is the table of elements that you see on your uh, chemistry wall and you should uh, remember it starts with hydrogen. Now, I'm a particle physicist, so I, I have trouble after helium. So it's hydrogen, helium, and then, then it gets more complicated. And it goes all the way out to uranium. So the question that gets asked is, where do they come from? Where are they made in the universe? So uh, the, the quick answer to that is there's the Big Bang. And we can go into that in some more detail if you like, but there's the beginning. And, Google it. Google it. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and in the beginning, there was uh, hydrogen, there was helium, but then the universe had expanded enough that it was hard to make the additional elements. You made a little bit of lithium, but then that was it. So the question was where did the other stuff come from? Well, then stars started to form for whatever reason gravitational attraction, maybe it was dark matter, which you've perhaps heard about. And those stars are just big furnaces that start burning or, or fusing the simplest atoms together at the beginning of the universe. Let's say 400 million years after the Big Bang, the first star started forming. And those stars were primarily hydrogen with a little bit of helium and nothing else. So they burned. And by burn, I mean they fuse the hydrogen to helium. And then I suppose the helium gets fused into oxygen, I'm going to guess. And then, uh, and then, you know, that's the end of the life. That's, that, that, was, that was it. The star would stop burning at some point. It would explode. And it would, during that explosion, we think it makes heavier elements. It makes an environment that's uh, conducive for making these heavier elements. And so then the next set of stars form, the next set of stars form. But we know that eventually the story is something like, stars make all the elements up to iron. And then above iron, something else happens. And so if you look at the periodic table, most of the elements are heavier than iron. So where were they made? So there's speculations. They're made after a star dies and explodes during that explosion. There's something called neutron stars, which are essentially big nuclei, a big neutron, if you like. 
and uh, they can collide together, they can merge, and you can make these extra elements in that process. And uh, there's, there's uh, objects called NOVA or NOVI, which are binary systems. So, you know, one of the interesting facts I learned when I was, was younger that you look up in the sky and you think most of the stars are just there by themselves, but in fact, 25, 30 percent of the stars are actually binary stars, two stars orbiting. So you could imagine our solar system having two suns. So if Jupiter was just a little bit bigger, it might have been another sun. And then you would have two suns. And in fact, there's been planets now observed in orbit about a system of two suns. So tell me how complicated that would be to set your There's a test set your, your, yeah. your alarm. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we do a number of experiments at Triumph with, with beams where we try and make the, uh, the elements that are made during that explosion of, of a star. And uh, we do it one by one and we study them in details. And the ultimate goal is to be able to try and predict the amount of each chemical element that we observe, say, in our solar system. And uh, that's a quest, it's a goal, it's, uh, it's gonna take a while. It takes more than a couple weeks. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in the process of doing that, you learn about what are called isotopes. That's the, the nuclei that are unstable. Um, there's, there's thousands of them. And some of these isotopes are used in uh, medical procedures. And so we, we use these isotopes at Triumph and uh, we in fact are able to make them in smaller cyclotrons, smaller accelerators, and we send them in a pneumatic tube up to UBC Hospital. So it's two miles in two minutes. It's a little plastic tube with a little bit of liquid in it that goes up and it gets injected into a patient and, and you, you, you image that patient with those isotopes. And uh, that particular research is focused on uh, Parkinson's and uh, all of the isotopes for the Parkinson's program at UBC come from Triumph. It comes from a small accelerator that would fit in this area in the front here. And that small accelerator, uh, the very first one that was made by Triumph uh, is still there, but there's a company in Richmond that's called ACSI that now is the third largest company in the world in terms of sales of medical cyclotrons. So that business has been booming. Mm -hmm. And that's because I would say nuclear medicine is becoming more and more uh, important for people. Uh, one of the other things we do, we were talking earlier, was uh, we use beams to treat ocular melanoma. So people get uh, uh, tumors at the back of the eye that are quite large. And when they get above a certain size, uh, your only option is either to remove the eye or you can treat it with what are called proton beams. And those proton beams have uh, special properties that allow you to uh, very selectively kill that tumor. And so that's, uh, that's a collaboration with uh, Catherine Payton, who's a doctor at uh, BC Cancer. And uh, so once a month, the patient comes in. It's the only place in Canada that does this. Once a month, the patient will come in and get a few treatments over three days. And it's about 95% successful. Yeah. So, you know, the scientists at, at Triumph are motivated by answering the, the whimsical questions of the universe. Where do we come from? What are we doing? How does this work? How does that work? But along the way, over the lifetime of the laboratory, many amazing things have, have taken place. And so the laboratory is this uh, village of very interesting things going on, uh, each with a, a different group of people trying to do uh, you know, their own thing and trying to do it better and have an impact. We're, we're sitting in a, in a facility where there's many labs. Um, when somebody thinks of an art university or Emily Carr, I think of paintings and uh, beautiful digital creations. But what I've learned in the modern age is that there's programmers and numbers, zeros and ones, that go on in the background to create beautiful websites and beautiful imagery. And so my next question or thought um, is for Ron is, do you see the science in art? Um, he's got notes. Did I stump him? No, I He's got know. notes. No, he's got notes. Yeah. I'll read yours. Yeah, right? you can read mine. Yeah, questions. It's, a, it's an interesting question because uh, uh, I think I'd have to reverse it and ask the question whether I see the art in science. There you go. But by way of coming to an answer, I think one of the things that fascinates me about science is the 
extraordinary presumption that knowledge can actually be contained by language. So Nigel is brilliant in the discourse. We were talking <clears throat> out of triumph and he, he gave me the layman's, or his interpretation of the layman's language to describe the accelerator, and it was wonderful. I learned a lot. But the interesting thing is that it's discourse. So uh, many years ago, I sat on a panel with uh, Leon Letterman, who was a Nobel Prize winner in physics, and we had this quite furious argument about it, because he said, no, it's reality. And I said, no, it's discourse, it's language. I said, that's what humans do. They have the presumption, even if they can prove empirically uh, that certain elements of what they're discussing are true, the presumption that they can understand the universe or understand the Big Bang, or, all of that is not a question of truth or non-truth. It's a question of language, because that's the tool. So the irony of that is that language by its very nature is uh, both ordered and disordered. When we speak, we speak in fragments. Yeah. Uh, when we write, we try to synthesize and write more systematically. But in reality, we're constantly struggling with language, struggling with ways to describe to ourselves and to others what we mean by what we say. And often what we mean by what we say is not what we intended to say, so we're caught in this circle of, did I mean that, or where did that come from? So I'm fond of saying to physicists, where did that come from? Um, you know, there, there's a deep metaphorical character to the notion of the Big Bang. It cannot be seen. Well, okay, it can be seen a bit. Traces can be seen, and that's the beauty of the experiments they do. But um, the irony is that the distinction between art and science, which is, by the way, new, historically, you know, the last 100, 150 years is when that division really tore apart because in the first stages of it, you got a Bachelor of Arts in order to get what we now call a science degree. And, and in fact, it, was, it, was in, it would have been incredible to say you got a Bachelor of Science. Why was it a Bachelor of Arts? Because you had to understand rhetoric and language to be able to express what you actually understood about the world you were describing. You had to have some depth in your discourse and some historical understanding of how that discourse could be translated. Um, so in the world I live in, we live in analogical and metaphorical worlds, and physicists and scientists always claim they live in real worlds. And I, I want to reverse, reverse the, the relationship and talk about how analogy and metaphor are crucial. Nigel just used a whole bunch of beautiful metaphors to describe triumph. I loved it. Um, I'm interested in the semantics of materials like how we talk about the material world. Uh, you know, <clears throat> there are all sorts of terms that uh, scientists use to explain the world to themselves, and then they tell us that that's the truth. And these are arbitrary, right? They were not God-given. In other words, the notion of the atom, somebody in Greece came up with the notion of the atom. I won't mention his name, because I always forget Heraclitus. Uh, uh, it's your business. I have a Bachelor of Science, by the way. But the notion that, that you know you bring this you bring this terminology to bear, and then you take the, the, the terminology and interpret the real mm. through it, is exactly what creative people engage with all the time. So the reason that the arts and the sciences were one for so long and then separated is because the discursive strength of the sciences was to convince really educational institutions which began to develop separate modalities and separate streams, governments, that what was happening in those fields was so crucial, and it is, to the future of who we are and what we think we are and where we think we're going, that uh, the division was necessary. What's happening now is that I think that scientists are realizing more so, and also artists more so than any other time in the past, that the links are deep. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish with one example. I'm interested in disorder. And I think what Nigel just described is an ordered universe that has logic attached to it. I'm interested in the, uh, the, the, the fact that disorder and complexity allow us to come up with ways of describing the world to ourselves that are far, more simple, far, far simpler than they actually are. And that in order to get to that point of simplicity, we have to take that disorder and really manage it, shape it, sculpt it. And well, that's what we do as artists. We manage, we shape, we sculpt. We work in all sorts of different ways to try and bring 
what we would describe, and I'm using the term we very carefully here, as truth. Because artists seek truth in the same way that scientists do. So I think the beauty of the relationship that has developed over the last number of years with Triumph is, the very first time I went out there and we had a wonderful discussion, is that I think the recognition now, more so than ever, that if we don't actually find the base of that relationship and we don't understand the way we use language in a similar way, and we, don't, and we need to understand how we investigate the world similarly, even though his world sounds a hell of a lot more complex than mine. Um, that, that need, that uh, move towards something that's more unified is, I think, basically a return to the 17th century, which was a good century for that stuff to work together on, however many illusions it generated. I'll leave it at that. I gotta provoke him to get really... <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to do. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, I, I, could, I could lead you into a, an area, but uh, what I'm... I can lead myself if yes, you want. Yes, you could, actually, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, what I, I am... I, I was serious, I wanted to respond I to I do want you comment. to, yeah, so yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually... Yeah, quiet. So, so the question that, that was, uh, we explored a little bit earlier was this question of beauty. Right. And so I had talked about, uh, there's, there's a, uh, it's, it's almost a street language of science where we talk about the beauty of various equations. So physics is a very mathematical subject. And so uh, a physicist will uh, feel comfortable looking at an equation and understand what it means. But as soon as he turns to his friend who's, or uh, someone who's not a physicist, or even just a chemist, a lowly chemist, <laughs> would, would say, you would have to explain to them what that means. And uh, equations that actually describe, describe nature uh, are often described as being beautiful equations. And so now the question is, what does beautiful mean to a scientist and what does beautiful mean to an artist? So that's what we were exploring earlier. So I was looking at the logo of, uh, of Triumph and Emily Carr. So they're, they're up there. And I asked myself, why do I think the logo of Triumph is beautiful? And I think it is a beautiful logo. It's a, it's a great logo. And it's simple, but it's not the pattern so much as what it stands for. It actually means something to it. Yeah. So it's, it's the pattern of the, uh, the, the, think of it as the, the plates that define the magnet that is the cyclotron itself. The accelerator is a, is a big magnet with electric fields in it. And those uh, fins that look like a fan are, are stationary, actually. And, and that's what uh, you know, causes the magnetic field within the accelerator. And, and so then that brings out all of the things that it does for us. You know, I think about the beams it makes, the people's lives it's impacting, the science we do with it. And so it's much, it's much deeper than uh, just, just a logo. And then I look at the Emily Carr logo, and it looks to me like, uh, I'm not sure what it means. I think I did it one time. I knew that uh, maybe it's not popular here, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I looked at it, and it looked like uh, a number of things I'm seeing. It could be the uh, sum of all possible orbits of an electron around an atom in, a, in an S, so-called S orbital, which Perfect. is the simplest, uh, <coughs> simplest form. So there's no single orbit. There's a series of orbits there, right. and you know the way quantum mechanics works is if I wanted to know where the electron was, it, I just know that it's one of those. I don't know which one it is at any given time until I have a look. So I wasn't sure I could interpret, you know, uh, the simplicity I like uh, of your logo, but I wasn't <laughs> sure what it means, and so I thought maybe you could explain that to us. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the discussion goes to debate, goes to interpretation, which I... I was standing uh, my ground on a, a, no, on no, a logo. No, no, it's, it's a very, very smart, very smart uh, move. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be quiet and allow you to explain, yeah. So, so yeah, th uh, no, that is not a beautiful logo. Um, I think it, uh, in, it, and it's not well represented in the slide. Uh, its origins lie in a, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, the metaphor of organism and the organic. Yeah. But it's actually a, a, a uh, if, if it were properly pictured, is a, a series of metal, very thin metal pieces hung together, yeah. that form a shape. And often uh, when we when we do videos, you know, the the metal unwinds on spools, and you see a 
you see something moving out of it. That's much prettier than the static version of it. So it was meant, for, meant to be dynamic. And so logos today are, for the most part, dynamic and not static. So you need your, your, your moving fan there. Uh -huh. It looks uh, like it is moving <laughs> to some people. But I think the issue of beauty is really important. Yeah. Because I think that, uh, you know, if you take a look at the, the wonderful textbooks that come out in, in physics and poor chemistry, but also in biology, and you, and you look at the extraordinary level of visualization that is involved in trying to understand complexity, and the degree to which that requires a, a deep understanding of visuality and the image, uh, then I think uh, we're start, we can start talking about real linkages and real connections. I mean, the, the best example of that is that uh, I, I love the way scientists show us the nano world, which they can only see in black and white, but, you know, make it look colorful. Or how the, the Hubble spacecraft is entirely the figment of the imagination of the astronomers uh, who show it to us. So this, you know, you look at it, but we're not seeing, you don't see color when you see. You don't see those massive explosions in color. Those are the hypotheses of... Of the, of the astronomers around the color that might or might not be. There's no color in space. So the question of visualize, visualizing the world and bringing it out and bringing meaning to the notion of a neutrino or bringing meaning to the notion of, of a, a constituent of matter is a, is a fantastically interesting and exciting and now accelerating area as we look more and more at vast data sets and try to figure out how to visualize what all that data means. Um, so I think the question of beauty is, is changing from a very classical definition within strict parameters of strict expectations into something really quite fluid and wonderful. And in, in the final analysis, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and for scientists, it's, uh, you know, the world is really beautiful because you're able to visualize it. And so when we were looking at the accelerator and, and you know, trying to imagine particles you can't see traveling at high speed and then smashing against resisting walls or interrupted so that some, some signal could be given. Which, what I think you didn't mention is that you don't really see that. You get the indication in a sideways way that something has happened, an event has occurred. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the challenge, the challenge is in, the, in, a, in a universe that we're accustomed to seeing through material eyes is how we actually talk about a universe that is really not as material as it feels and that what we think is tangible is very intangible. I can tell you that there's not an artist I know that hasn't thought about that issue and hasn't thought about trying to picture that set of conflicts and contradictions and trying to resolve some form and shape that will express the complexity of that. What often happens, um, and I'll use this, uh, and it's with, said with the greatest of respect, is that a lot of scientists just say, well, can I have a nice picture in my office and this will make me really feel like I'm connected to the arts? I get this, by the way, from the government all the time. They always want our stuff, right? Oh, give us a painting so that they can resolve the, the deep guilt they feel about their disconnection from creativity. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, there's this notion that, it's, that art is an add-on. So uh, I think when you talk about visualization, you're talking about creativity, you're talking about picturing, you're talking about images, you're talking about ways of explaining not only to the public, but to yourself what you can't see. So it's language and image. That's what we do. Well, the only thing we don't do is that we don't end up being able to send a spacecraft into orbit. So that's an issue. <laughs> we can't do that. You can make a movie of it or draw a picture of <laughs> we it. We could actually, as Melies did, fake it, however. Yeah. And we faked it well enough in the cinema that people thought that they were watching something going up into space. So do you actually believe people went to the moon? I do, actually. <laughs> Very good. Yes. I'm not part of the conspiracy group. No, no. <laughs> is, there, is there something behind um, definitive, d definitive answers, getting, getting to that number, that final, final achievement in science that is somewhat different from art, mm -hmm. where it's, it can constantly be interpreted? Um, I, I remember um, attending a, a, a party where everyone was painting on a picture. And we were painting all evening, all evening. And we thought we got to that perfect spot. We thought we did. And then a few hours later, we started painting again. In science, we're coming to a very definitive answer, and that will move uh, further research and further answers. Do you, do you feel that within the art world that could be achieved as well, where you find a definitive answer? 
and back to you in the science world. Am I, am I correct that once we get to that definitive answer, we can move on to another segment? And I'm going to let either of you speak first. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say, in general, scientists like to measure a number yeah. and, and uh, <laughs> measure it extremely well and then measure it again. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I thought you were going somewhere with where, uh, you know, you were all painting on the same, uh, same piece of paper or whatever. Yeah. So scientists uh, are, attack a problem and uh, the problem is not answered with a number usually, sure. it's, it's answered with uh, many different, uh, I'll say many, many numbers and, and many attempts and uh, the creativity comes in, uh, you know, I, I think uh, if you go to Triumph and you look at the, uh, I'll call it the equipment, it's really yeah. the experiments on the floor. It's pretty amazing. They're very real. You know, they're made out of metal. Uh, and so there's people actually building physical things and they do something with it and they, they have an idea and it may take them several years to do it. And in the biggest experiments in the world, it often takes a decade or maybe even two decades for something to begin. And it takes thousands of people to do it. And, but they're all on this same, I'll say journey. They're all, uh, going in the same direction and, and it, it's like a big family and everybody decides what they're doing you know somebody's gonna clean the house and somebody's yeah. gonna do the dishes and somebody's gonna cook dinner well in a big uh, big physics experiment you you split up the chores amongst thousands of people but you may be focused on just answering one single question with with all of that that effort and time and investment and uh, that's when it really becomes uh, more than just a collection of numbers. At some point, that collection of numbers starts to describe uh, what we would call the reality around us. And being able to put that into words is uh, what scientists do. So I'll use the example of the Higgs boson discovery, which was, uh, was last year. It was, it was in all the newspapers. And I'm sure if you read all, every newspaper article very carefully, you would see there wasn't quite a, an agreement on what it was you had discovered. It was something obviously important in science. Mathematically, it was well-defined. There was no question what it was mathematically. But how do you explain to your neighbor what had been discovered by, I, I'm, I'm gonna estimate there's five, 6,000 people involved in that discovery, all focused on trying to do the same thing. And it's been viewed as a, as a goal of particle physics for, uh, you know, since I was a grad student. So it's, it's been a long, long goal. And subsequent uh, experiments all tried to find it, didn't find it. You build new experiments, you can't find it. So where's the creativity? The creativity is, I know how to find it. And then you go look and you don't find it. So now somebody else has an idea. So this was, uh, so I was asked a question by uh, Jennifer earlier today, why, why are we interested in art at Triumph? Yeah. And the answer is art is a creative uh, enterprise and uh, physicists look at the world and they think they understand what they're looking at. And, and the fact that an artist comes along and puts a picture up on the wall and we don't understand what it is, then, then you really caught the physicists off guard and they say, what the heck is that? And, and why did they draw it? And, and how was the technique? What was the technique? And what were the instruments that were used to make it? Because you automatically want to decompose it down into its, its, uh, its the reductionist view of the world. You, th you think you can understand it. So having that, uh, putting a piece of art in a scientific environment is, uh, stimulates the scientists, but the, the re response of the artists, I think, is uh, that they're curious at how the scientists see it. And, and we've, we've gone through some exercises where we've gone both ways. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it all comes back to you're trying to get to something, you don't know how to do it, you need to be creative to do it, and it all starts with your brain somehow or a sure. collection of brains. And uh, you do it together. And so that's, that's what makes it exciting. Is there a definitive answer, definitive answer at the end of like, you know, okay, finally we can put it in this art textbook, we're done this painting, or a thought, an idea. Have you ever seen that, or is it ongoing? It's always ongoing. I mean, I think yeah. the, the, the beautiful thing about Triumph, and I think I've been there three or four times now, the beautiful thing about Triumph is that 
the first thing I want to do is get a camera and start shooting in it yeah. because the shapes, the forms, that the colors amazing. are really quite extraordinary to see. It's just got a very, very textured look to it. The question that always rises in my mind is how do these shapes come to be what they are? And Nigel has a very clear scientific answer. <laughs> you know, if you need to send a particle somewhere, you've got to have a circular structure for it. If you've got to have a, if you have a vacuum, you've got to have a particular shape for it and so on. Um, but I'm more interested in the step before that. The step before you sort of build the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, like what, 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 what makes you want to think in that way in the first place? Uh, why, would, why would we pursue the notion of the Big Bang? Or why would we pursue the idea of materiality? What, what motivates us to think that that's important enough? So in, in, other, in, in other words, I think the, uh, it's a complex issue because, you know, the curiosity, the desire to understand materiality, to understand everything that is circulating in the air today here in this room is a very strong, forceful one. But the question of why is important. Uh, it comes to the... Uh, I, I see science as looped into the social context in which it operates. And in that loop of social context and politics and culture, that loop is a very uh, different one from generation to generation. Each generation, if we go back to Newton as an example, has had a different explanation, quite sure of themselves each time, by the way, uh, you know, of, of each set of phenomena that they've encountered. And so why, why do we do that? Why, why, you know, I mean, Newton set up a structure for the world and an explanation for it that we then discovered 150 years later was incorrect and you know, looked at questions of causality and rationality and all of that and trying to figure out, now why did that happen? Well, that was actually necessary at that time in order to actually push science forward to where it is today. But if you were to go back from today, it looks primitive and ill thought out. Um, so what is it about the step before that makes us assume that we can actually get to the answer? And, and that's what fascinates me. Well, you said something which caught my attention. First of all, I'm a big fan of Newton, and I, and I wouldn't say that he's incorrect. I would say that uh, we improved upon his understanding uh, of the world. But just the fact that, that uh, people are comfortable when you're talking about science to say whether it's correct or incorrect. And so my question is, when you look at a piece of art, do you say, is it correct or incorrect? Is that, is that thought process go through your, your mind? It that, does. Well, it does in a sense because... The As a teacher, maybe it does. <laughs> no, no, I think... That, uh, no, I think, the, uh, uh, I think that artists strive for truth in a very similar way. The truth is perhaps perceived to be more subjective. And so we have this false distinction between the subjective and the ob objective. We, we may not want to go down this route. I mean, I don't want to get... I, I, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think that what you're asking is, is actually related to the empirical. And, yeah. and empiricism and what we mean by the real. And I would argue that that is a deeply cultural assumption. And that if, if it is an, a deeply cultural assumption, that the, the manner in which we end up explaining what we know will inevitably reflect the Sorry. cultural context we're in. So I think artists struggle very heavily with, with empiricism. So when you have a material object, when you're trying to sculpt a piece of wood, there could be nothing more direct than that kind of empirical reality. You're holding and feeling that. Yeah. Now, it would be fantastic if I could put my fingers through it and feel its molecular structure. You'd love it, too. Mm -hmm. Well, we can now. Yeah. So we have a device which we can program. Maria's here. We could program that. Where are you, Maria? We could program that, couldn't we? Yeah, see? So we could actually program for Nigel this experience. He'd have to wear a little mask and stuff. It'd be a bit artificial in the first instance. But we could program that sense of touching materiality. Now, the fact that we can do that as digital artists is entirely dependent on the information we've learned from physics. Mm -hmm. But equally, and on the flip side, I would argue that the way Triumph is built, its structure, the, the beauty of its interaction, That's the right. aesthetic, is what you learn from us. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I think people get excited when they go to Triumph. It's like this, wow, you know, look at this. It actually has a physical feel, but we can't see anything. Because we don't see acceleration. We just see outside, not inside. Yeah, I was going to say, there's, there's, uh, there's, gr there's great artists, there's great scientists, and then there's Steve Jobs. 
And Steve, Steve Jobs is often uh, characterized as uh, kind of a mixture. So he, he created an, an object which is physically beautiful. I think we, we yeah. like what he's created. It is, uh, feels great. It, it's mm -hmm. the right size. It's got the right uh, easiness of use. And at the same time, it's one of the most sophisticated <coughs> technical objects that has been created. So uh, you don't see that from everybody. And so when you ask, uh, we had a, a visitor at Triumph last week who who'd worked in the, for RIM, and, and, and I asked her if, if she thought Steve Jobs <laughs> was a genius or was, was he, uh, you know, he was just the leader of the company. And, and the answer was clearly genius because of, of, of the merger of what I would say art and design with technology. And, and the, that's what people want in the end. I, I think um, to jump in there, I, my generation is trying to build companies and products and services that are, again, aesthetically pleasing to the people on the outside, yet inside there's this machine going on. So there's this art, art, artistic view of, of a product or service or a feeling that you get from um, a device or a, or a service or an interaction online. But there's these mechanical keys and, and again, numbers going on in the background. And a lot of us young entrepreneurs are trying to create that whole genre. So how do you engage younger people who are trying to get into the science and art worlds? And how do you keep it new? Or, or is it new? Uh, I, uh, your verb is incorrect. Could be. We don't engage, we are engaged. We are engaged. There you go. I think uh, uh, great. Uh, teachers are always being engaged, as opposed to the, the old model of, I will engage you. That might be an outcome of being engaged, as opposed to, I'm engaging you. The pre-industrial model of teaching was, I know, you don't. Post-modern, right. post thankfully, and post-industrial notion of learning is, I know nothing, you know everything. So where can we meet midway through right. that exchange? So your question is wrong. Sorry. It's OK. <laughs> I'm learning, too. <laughs> where do you find your talent for a triumph? Uh, the web. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. you, uh, you, you just, you don't care where they come from, obviously. Yeah. So they speak you, the same language, though. They, they, speak, they speak the physics, the language of physics. So yeah. we, we go all over the world for our, yeah. our talent. And uh, fortunately, Triumph's name is sufficiently well known that yes. uh, people view it as a, an attractive place to go to. So it's, uh, it's been very successful in attracting uh, some of the best scientists in the world to the lab. I don't know if uh, we've mentioned, we haven't mentioned this, but you're moving on from Triumph. That's right. You're going, this is, this is Nigel's last week at Triumph, yeah. and he's going to a little place in Chicago called the Fermi Lab, is that right? Yeah, we don't usually say the Fermi there, Lab. There, it's, it's we say non -science Fermi Lab, guy. named Fermi after Lab. Enrico Fermi. Yes. And, uh, uh, Tell us about what you're doing up there. Right now, I'm, I'm doing nothing, but uh, Friday afternoon, <laughs> I'll be picking my chair out. So that's, that's the <laughs> most that, important eh? thing. That, yeah. yeah. So I'm told they have a chair gallery. It's a big lab, so you uh, get to choose the uh, perfectly designed chair, maybe an Emily Carr designed chair. There you go. And, uh, and so that'll, that'll be my, my starting position. And uh, what, what Fermilab does, Fermilab's a big lab. It's, um, I'll say it's uh, five or six times bigger than Triumph. It's the, the main particle physics lab in the United States. And uh, for the last 20 years, it's been the lab that's had the highest energy in the world. So everybody went there. And then uh, I'll say in 2006, 2007, uh, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN turned on. And the, the physicists are shameless. They just go where the best facility is, <laughs> and, and they, they turn their back on their friends, and they're, they're gone. CERN and, put you on the spot. Yeah, there. so yeah. They, uh, they all go to CERN. And so, you know, I, I've been given the job of, uh, you know, how do we get them back? Yeah. You know, that's, uh, so, so there's a lot of interesting questions in particle physics now. So the challenge is to decide which one of those you're kind of capable of doing, yeah. and uh, you got to look to your friends. It's no longer a, a business of, of that lab. It's a business of all the labs in the world, the universities in the world. So 
Science, uh, especially particle and nuclear physics, is, is, is a worldwide subject. There is no such thing as, as borders. And uh, it's, a, it's a community that um, it has, has, I would say, evolved tremendously in the last 20 years, such that um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's evolved into a, a, uh, almost a global planning exercise. So you cannot plan to do what you want mm -hmm. by yourself or even nationally. You have to sit at the table with the rest of the world, whether it's China, whether it's India in our case. We were uh, collaborating with India uh, and Triumph or uh, you, you name your favorite country. If they have a scientist, they'll be paying attention to what these labs are doing, and then they decide what, where they want to go and what they want to contribute to. And that's, uh, that, that's a pretty, pretty satisfying uh, environment to be working in. Very smart people, all committed towards solving a, an exciting question. You know, what, what is the character of the neutrino, however you want to describe that? Why, why did God make this particle that you know, there's a, there's a hundred million of them going through my thumbnail per second as I sit here. It doesn't hurt. That's a good thing. They're going through you also. <laughs> but why would such a strange object be created at the, the beginning of the universe? And, and uh, you know, people have made, uh, scientists have made tremendous progress in understanding what they are and what their role is. but but. There's, you, it, may, it becomes a career. That, that, that's, the, that's your lifelong mission, is to learn as much as you can about perhaps that single particle. And then you would go around the world and find out other people that have that same, same dream. And then you would get together with them, and then they, they become your... It's a big party. Your, your, yeah, it's a big party. Nigel's understating it. The Fermi Lab is pretty close to the apex of what you would yes. want to achieve in a career of his. So, so it's, it's an extraordinary achievement. I'm jealous. <laughs> We're moving in to the farmhouse. <laughs> yeah. um, that's actually, that's great that I got some feedback from the group here, some energy. Uh, what I'd love to do is hand around a microphone and um, include you all in the conversation as well and maybe ask these two gentlemen, I mean, I can answer minimal, but ask these wonderful gentlemen some ideas and questions and thoughts that you might have from this discussion today. So we'll just pass around a microphone and uh, Sean will hand that out. Just a quick question. Um, if art and science are equal like they are here, what, what are your theories as to why governments spend way more money on science than on art? So, Anybody well, from the government in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, part of what uh, Nigel and I talked about some weeks ago was the, uh, the effort on the part of uh, both American, Canadian governments, British, Australian, to uh, stem the, the tide of STEM. In other words, to enhance STEM uh, teaching and learning in universities and uh, also in high schools. So science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And uh, there's a, a strong effort underway in the United States, far less so in Canada, to turn that into steam. So it's put, put art into the STEM. But I'm not convinced that that gets, gets to the root of the problem. Um, I, the, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, present government policy really has moved towards what it best be described as a 19th century industrial model. We're back into, uh, you know, a, a kind of learn, become, die. Uh, you know, the, the linearity of the assumptions that are going into present day policy are, 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 are not good. And so as a consequence, it, it, it's much easier to say, because it's, it is easier, that here are the very concrete things that people need to learn in order to have careers that will have an impact on the on societies we live in. It's much harder to say, here are a bunch of areas that some people can't actually go into because there's some people who cannot do the sciences and don't have the mind for math and are not poly in the sense of being able to jump over areas um, and yet have a great deal to contribute. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply the argument about the fact that the arts need to be part of everything, which I believe they should be and are anyway. It's the deeper argument around what we actually identify as the social norms we live in. What makes us who we are? What do we value and what do we share? And if we're not capable as a society or as a group of uh, actually speaking about that, which we are, but we don't, 
then governments step in and say, well, if you don't have those subjects, you can't get those jobs. And uh, that's a real challenge. That's a really deep problem. Uh, it's not going to be solved by putting an A into STEM. <coughs> I think it's, it behooves scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and others to begin to talk with everyone about the need for a much more organic and holistic view of how we all interact with differing uh, ideas and thoughts, and we all have different existential crises and different solutions to different problems. And that if we start to segment, we start to recreate in a way that is really detrimental to everyone, to scientists as well as to artists. So this is a very, very serious, we're in a very serious time, I can tell you, from a policy point of view. Yeah. I just want to say quickly that science <coughs> is, not, is not a monolith. Yeah. So science, if you talk about base, basic science, where uh, often gets called curiosity-driven science, it's in the same boat as art. Yeah. So the government is, every government, not just the Canadian government, or the U.S. government, but all governments are struggling with what is the value of basic science versus applied science. Yeah. Applied science is very simple. I am going to solve this problem. I'm going to make a better battery for your, your hybrid car. But basic science says, I want to know where the universe comes from. And the <coughs> response usually Excuse is, me. why do we care where the universe comes from? What good does it do us? So it actually goes back to the public, and the public has to value uh, science and art because they're the ones who speak to the government, and that's who the government listens to. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a hot topic. I, you, you've touched on a, a nerve with me, is that we're always trying to justify uh, why we're here. And you know, I've had experiences with the government where I start off describing the science, and they just stop you, and they say, we want to hear about the applications. Because that's what the country cares about. So uh, until the country recognizes that it's a more, uh, uh, there's benefits to being creative and really, you used the word disruptive, I guess, at one point. That's, that's how you're going to be disruptive, not these, these incremental changes. Ken Schneider, uh, among other things on the board of Science World, uh, I confess to reading physics for fun and actually uh, writing, doing my own words and music. Um, Sadly, no one will pay me for either. Um, and I'm curious about the kind of <coughs> fundamental question I would like to hear both of you talk about. The concept of um, things like, is the mind actually real or is it simply the result of electrochemistry? Do, is mathematics discovered or is it invented? Is there an inherent two-ness in the universe, or is the number two something that somebody thought of? Well, I, I, can, I can take a stab at a part of that. It's, that that's, that's a, 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 what is that? That's have to get drunk for that one, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, More uh, wine, yeah. The, uh, I, uh, let me reframe it this way. Uh, I think that uh, the, the, the present sort of emphasis on, in the neurosciences on, uh, translating the complexity of mind into uh, picture points where images tell us something about where thoughts are located is perhaps one of the most uh, dangerous phenomena that I've seen uh, in, in research and I, and I read widely, I, I also read physics journals for my pleasure. Um, I'm very worried about it, uh, but it, it says a lot about the cultural moment we're in. So the cultural, it comes back to the notion of applied. The mind, I don't believe, can be reduced to the brain, nor should it be. Uh, the mind is not a computer, nor should it be. Uh, we are not programmed, thank goodness. We're nuts. We're totally and utterly, half the time, confused about who we are. Thank God. Thank whoever. Um, so the notion, the notion that you can actually pop a imaging machine uh, uh, and then see a place where I get excited. Says something about the region in which, you know, my brain uses neurons and chemistry and electricity to excite me. But the notion that we can take the complexity, I, I don't have the full trillion number in my head at the moment of the interactions that are happening as I speak right now. But the notion we can reduce that, that reductive notion, that's like 300 years old. And it infuriates me that 
the lack of knowledge about the history of science and the history of, of investigations into the mind. It infuriates me that we actually have such a simplistic journalistic culture and media culture that doesn't actually take a look at what this means. To make the suggestion that, we, that we're solving what the brain does is absurd. I had a debate with Doug Copeland, one of the great graduates of Emily Carr here, and uh, he's, he, he was, so he's fascinated by this. He's a brilliant guy. And he's, wow, I can understand. But, he, but he's also really crazy, right? So he, I can understand. Nah, I get it. That's why this is sort of weird. And uh, I said, no, no, no. And then I said, he said, the brain, it's all, it's all plastic. And I said, no, plasticity is a metaphor. We don't exactly understand how that can be applied to the brain. I mean, we all know we learn, so things change. The notion of plasticity is much more complex. So long, long answer to, to a very difficult question is, it's part of a, a social space we occupy today that is looking in an applied sense at solving the fact that we are totally and utterly involved in our own neuroses every day, and they think, in their naivete, that they're solving some of those problems. And, you know, that goes back to lobotomy. It goes back to the early stages of the neuroscience investigation. I think some of those scientists uh, would be turning in their graves if they were to see some of the comments that are coming out. I I'd advise you to read Steven Pinker's response to this stuff, because it's brilliant. So that's, a, that's an answer to that one. And, and Nigel, what did the reductionists have to say about that? I better be careful. <coughs> so so I, would, I would say that uh, I was going to address your comment on mathematics, and so uh, I, th I think there are there, there's a lot of uh, evidence in in uh, the standard model of physics that mathematics describes rather precisely. By precisely, in some cases, ten decimal places, fifteen decimal places, uh, what nature's what nature's up to and uh, whether mathematics is the ultimate language of uh, our universe and how it works, that, I think that the jury's still out on that one. But certainly that's what we do now. That's, our, uh, that's, that's how we understand what we do. That's how we predict what will happen. And so modern science is, is a combination of mathematical calculations of a, of a, you know, of a particular type that predicts something will happen, and then the experimentalists come out and try and measure it. And I decided to become an experimentalist because that's the last word. You know, the theorists have to go back and try and get my answer. <laughs> so, assuming I got it right. So, uh, I, at, this, at this point, you know, it, it's obviously debated quite a bit, but uh, the, the field functions based on mathematics right now. My, my field, physics. Thank you for the question. Anyone else? Yeah. This is sort of related. First of all, I want to say to Ron that I think the work being done in uh, neuroscience is now is brilliant work, and a lot of it is in trying to understand the plasticity of the brain. But the thing I wanted to come back to is when you talk about language, as we humans learn language, by force, we have to learn how to abstract. Mm -hmm. So language is a process of abstract thinking. Mm -hmm. And the abstractions there are, in a way, common between arts and sciences, except that and, 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 and mathematics is the way that we, is, is, is a very good way of expressing not all, but many of this mm -hmm. abstraction. Process. Mm -hmm. And it, it, mathematics describes all kinds of worlds. And the difference with the science is we have a test and we throw out all kinds of beautiful, consistent things which don't work. Uh, but the whole process of abstraction is really the key common element between the arts and sciences. And Without the abstraction, all of the results in science are meaningless. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's a really shared space, uh, and it's a profound space. That notion of abstraction, I mean, I love mathematics. You know, uh, I, I love the notion of, but you know, when I, talk, when I think about mathematics, I can also think about symbols. I think about representation. Yeah, right? That's what it is. Yeah, and that's what it is. So 
for me, the, 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 there's an organic relationship between what we do and what mathematicians do. I think the difference is that the, there, there's a force applied to truth that is deeper and maybe more correct than could ever be applied within the arts. What about mathematics? Mathematics is not the experiment, but just consistency. Yeah. And in yeah. arts, it doesn't it have to be. <coughs> At some level, a, uh, a thing that draws different kinds of art together. Yeah, yeah. Is that communication? Yeah, no, no. Uh, I, I think we're in agreement. Just on the neuroscience comment, I do agree the research is really interesting. But I'm talking about uh, a sort of reductive approach to brain uh, mechanism. Uh, well, a mechanical approach to the brain that then is translated into the mind. And uh, that's for a longer discussion. As much as I am fascinated by it, I'm really worried about it too. Yeah, I know. That really scares me. Thank you. Mind. Yes. Um, <laughs> do we have somebody back there and then we'll get uh, Steve oh. in, yeah, right after. Yeah. Um, I, I remember once asking somebody if our greatest fear was death, and they responded no. Our greatest fear is uncertainty. And that really resonated with me, and it seemed to me to approach maybe the motivation of artists and scientists about this issue of just wanting to explain to each other what's happening. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the stuff of that. So what, what are the ingredients of that exploration in both fields? Hmm. Nigel. Oh. It's a really good question. Uh, so if I'm understanding you right, you're, you're, the first part of it is about uncertainty as a shared framework or concern, but also a shared fear. So the fear that uncertainty will leave you with no concrete sense of what connects to what and how things mean. The second part, can you articulate that a bit again? More has to do, I guess, I guess, with the issue of abstraction, or what is it? What are the ingredients of that exploration? So, if you're a scientist, you're looking at neutrons, protons, how things collide. You're really looking at the very tiny of how it works. But it seems to me artists uh, are looking at other stuff, still looking at systems, still looking at things yeah. that interact. So, I'm just kind of wondering: is, is there a way that we can come up with a shared? Understanding. Oh, absolutely. Like, I think, I think that uh, it, uh, it was the National Research Council that decided some 15 years ago to, to bring artists into play in, in, in Ottawa. Hmm. And uh, the initial assumption was a very superficial one. Let's have our artists sort of present in the research lab. They may have some ideas from time to time that may be of interest and so on. And they discovered that the shared uh, desire to understand, in this case, materiality, was so profound that the dialogue changed totally. The NRC, uh, you know, was was defunded in that particular area because <laughs> it didn't didn't wow. ha have the outcomes that government wanted. But notwithstanding that, it was at least five to ten years that they had this artist in residence program. Hmm. Um, so the question of the of this dialogue is really essential. I, I think uh, pure science not applied science faces the same challenges that we do in the world of the arts. Uh, you know, the, the notion of exploration, the notion of uncertainty, which is really important to hold on to for a long, long, long time before you become certain. Uh, the notion that exploration is actually productive without necessarily having an end, that it doesn't have to have a, a goal that is clearly defined but can actually be flowing and, and moving and changing. All that, I think, Scientists with the, the, that same sense of curiosity actually share that deeply, which is why, in a sense, almost to begin with, in the first contacts that we had with clients, that was one of the first things we actually talked about, was just that shared sense of intense desire. I, and, and I don't want to be essentialist about it, but you know, there's something about this desire, this curiosity, that is so fundamental to how we've come to this point in, in our history. I mean, that, that curiosity has driven us to do extraordinary things as human beings. And I think from a, uh, from a policy point of view, and this is the, my pragmatic side flying into it, my greatest fear is that we just don't have enough intelligence being applied here 
to understanding that would I be correct in saying, Nigel, and you'll have to correct me, that a good deal of what we would describe as the outcomes of experimental science were partly resolved through chance and accident? That, yeah, sure, sure. So, so yeah. I, you know, I, I say that because chance and accident are at the heart of what we actually, how we actually navigate <laughs> in the world. We, if we had a predetermined path set out for us before we actually understood navigation, uh, we wouldn't know how to assimilate all of that. So I, I think we share something that is so important, and at this point in history, something that needs to be enunciated and actually brought out to the public and needs to be understood, which is this, this, this uncertainty about who we are, why we are. I mean, we're destroying the planet. Okay, we know that we're doing that, but how do we translate that uncertainty into something that we can move with? and change, and change ourselves in the process. So I, there's a lot a lot there, but it, it's gonna require, uh, and particularly around, uh, you know, particularly in engineering and in math, some really high level talks among enough people to bring enough force to that argument so that policymakers will listen to it. We are in a dangerous time, to be frank. I don't know if Nigel feels that way, but I feel that the funding funnel is, is narrowing so deliberately towards a very limited set of defined outcomes and leaving aside all of the wide range of what we need to understand. Hi, Steve Curtis of Zag. So first off, I'm extreme ADHD and I've been totally captivated all night, so loving, <laughs> loving this. Uh, my question is, we, we live in a time of a lot of change where uh, things like Moore's Law and Kurzweil with the singularity are talking about how humanity will change and how uh, the world we live in will change to a great extent. And so I'm curious, in each of your fields of endeavor, how you see the next five, ten years and the world evolving from that perspective? Well, that's a good question. Um, in my own little micro world <coughs> of uh, particle physics, um, uh, lots of interesting things I think will happen in, in the, I'll say the next 20 or 30 years, for example. So um, we, you know, our, our present understanding of uh, the early universe, is, which is what drives me, is the, the, the curiosity part of the early universe, is uh, we're at 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Okay, so the, the discoveries at, that are taking place today at CERN and, and elsewhere are uh, 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang. So I hope you know what I mean by 10 to the minus 12. Zero, point zero, 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 and then finally you got 12 at the one at the end of that. So that sounds like a very small time, but in, in, in physics it's, it's pretty late in the universe, uh, in, in the uh, in, in the initial singularity, as you referred to it, nobody knows whether it's a singularity or not, but that's, that's another issue. <coughs> but um, we're, we're starting to probe periods as early as 10 to the minus 34 seconds, 10 to the minus 35 seconds now. And uh, there's, there's uh, you know, there, you've probably heard about the inflationary universe, which is, it, which is a period where, uh, you know, at the beginning people think there was really only one force. And then that force broke apart at, as, as the universe expanded. And so, first of all, gravity breaks off. And you, and let's say there's four forces. So gravity breaks off and the other three together. And then a little bit further in the expansion of the universe, and it's not this big, by the way, it's very small at this point. Uh, then the strong interaction breaks off. And then a little while later, the electromagnetic and weak break off. That's where we are today experimentally. We understand the period where the electromagnetic and weak force broke apart. So the fact that we found the Higgs boson is a, is a super hint that maybe the universe started with just one force. And that one force, there was a period when um, in order to, see the, to, to arrive at the universe we see today, it had to go through an expansion. And that uh, superluminal expansion, which means an expansion faster than the speed of light, was necessary so that the, uni the, the universe was flat in space and it looks like the way it is. 
And so they sound like fantastic, crazy things that we could actually understand that. So now we're probing, like I said, back to 10 to minus 35 <coughs> seconds. But there'll be experiments in the next uh, 10, 10, 20 years that are directly probing those questions. And uh, thousands of people are involved, both in astronomy and in astrophysics and particle physics and nuclear physics. That's, that's what people do. Now, why is, that, why is that important? Why is it, uh, you know, how, why, why are we doing that? Just because we want to know the answer. There's no other reason. And uh, that's why the government has trouble funding it. <laughs> so, uh, but nevertheless, that's, uh, I, I think you'll see fantastic discoveries in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. Thank you. I think uh, we're, uh, my own sense is that we're at a very interesting juncture culturally. Uh, that will, over the next decade to two decades, see us working inside new kinds of spaces, particularly virtual worlds, and using digital technologies to explore uh, what Nigel just explained in language, but explore it as a living experience. So using visualization and all sorts of uh, differing aesthetic tools to try and understand something that is far more important than simply just getting the answer to a question, but just simply trying to understand, keep it in process. So one, one part of it is very exciting. I do think that, uh, we, that the, the level at which the generation that's coming to Emily Carr is involving itself inside these worlds, inside this sort of strange continuum between the real and the virtual, is so profound that it's hard to evaluate exactly how that will how that will grow or whether it'll decline or whether it'll, it'll, be, it'll encapsulate or whether it'll be permeable and so forth. But I would say that uh, a, a trend that really fascinates me is that you know, human beings have been communicating with each other ever since human beings came on the earth and uh, the, the level at which we can now communicate with each other both in real worlds and virtual worlds and all sorts of other worlds is so intense and so extraordinary that I think for artists it's the blossoming of a really golden age because that's what artists do. They engage in circles and cycles of communication and interaction trying to figure out how things work and why and how language allows them access to ideas and thoughts and feelings and emotions and how to translate all of that into something either physical or, or not. Um, so I, I, I'm very optimistic, I'm really positive. Uh, I think that uh, we have, uh, at Emily Carr, we experiment all the time. And I think that's the word we haven't used enough here, is that, you know, the, the shared experience that scientists and artists have always had <coughs> is this absolute impulse to, to experiment, and I think that's going to accelerate. Uh, because it, it, the, at least through the, gen, the, through the eyes of the generation that uh, I've seen, many generations come through Emily Carr, and, uh, you know, each generation has its own pragmatic solutions ahead of itself. It wants to solve certain kinds of problems. But one thing that is common for me is this endless desire uh, to create. And I think that that, I, I speak to a lot of audiences, one of the things that happens in, in the course of those uh, discussions is that people come up to me and say, you know, I really wanted to be an artist. We haven't heard Nigel say that, because he's actually an artist of physics. But Many people come and say, I really want to be an artist. Well, what they're really saying is, you know, there's a part of me that I haven't found that I need to find. And I think that as we move forward, as all these tools become more accessible, as, and you're doing it already with your phones and with other devices, you're involved in this real extraordinary expulsion of creativity. I mean, when two and a half billion YouTube videos are being uploaded on a yearly basis, that's people. Uh, and so that's where I think we're headed, into a very interesting cacophonous universe of communication and interchange. Yeah, I, he I heard you say optimism, and I would say that describes most scientists too. They're optimistic that they can answer a question. And my favorite cartoon is, is a dog looking at a blackboard with equations on it. And, and you know the dog's never going to understand, <coughs> understand the math on the board. And, and yet, you know, it's it may wagging. be... It's it, tail's wagging. It's tail's wagging, I guess. <laughs> but you, uh, unless it's been cut off. But uh, I think, you know, scientists believe they can get the answer. They, we, we may just not be even close to getting the answer, but we don't know. We're optimistic about it in ways that we can figure everything out. So that keeps everybody going. Well, uh, one last question, and then um, we'll wrap up. In here. I was very excited to come here tonight to, to see the blend of art and science. 
Um, I've also listened to both you and, and felt your passion. I've also heard the word legislation many, many times. Um, I raised two children, and every summer, without fail, or the spring, we'd go to Science World, or we'd go to an art gallery, or both, for separate identities. <coughs> every year that I brought them to a classroom, I would look in the classroom and know whether they would learn by that teacher. Hmm. Both my children were creative. If the teacher was scientific and mathematical, I knew there'd be a difficulty. I believe that legislation is fine, but it isn't going to teach us anything. It's just going to tell us. I believe we have to start at the beginning. We have to blend science and art to the very young so they grow up with it mm -hmm. and understand it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it'll never start. What are your feelings on that? Oh, I couldn't uh, agree more. But, I, but I'll, I'll make you feel more optimistic by telling you that we have a very interesting project developing with Science World. So when we move to this new campus at Great Northern Way, hopefully in three years, um, where the air conditioning will work, um, <laughs> we, uh, we're going to establish a science art walk, connecting Science World, which is only 10, 12 minutes away from where the new campus will be. We'll be <coughs> establish a walk that will connect the two. And the goal is that in the space between, which will be the space that we will try and bring closer and closer, there will be works all along the way. Uh, and that will be curated jointly by Science World and, uh, and Emily Carr. And will over time build the legacy of the connection because I think the only way to get to the solution that you're looking for is through the actual materiality of people's experiences. And so children don't distinguish between art and science. You know, they're, they're curious and they want to solve problems. And they're problem solvers. They're doing it all the time. Our job as uh, teachers is to open up the space for that problem solving to be a rich, exciting experience and not uh, to reduce it down to something that doesn't work for the child. Uh, I'll reveal something tonight. I spent two years in the sciences at McGill. Few people know this. Uh, and I loved every minute of it. Uh, you know, it was the, for me, I, it reached a point of ex, uh, such extraordinary intensity that the notion of not doing science was inconceivable. But I couldn't get away from the image. And I had to go, I had to go in another direction. Um, and I think giving a child an opportunity like I had very early on to really discover for themselves what connects and what disconnects will take a, a, a change in how we think about teaching and learning. And it's happening. So the optimistic thing is many, many people in many fields are talking actively about trying to deal with these issues. And I, I think that, the, again, the generation that is coming into Emily Carr today does not see the distinction as solidly and with as many barriers as the generations before. And so we are moving in that direction. But I hate to say it, from a pragmatic perspective, we need, do need government support. So we need to convince a whole bunch of constituencies in order to make that an effective outcome. <coughs> so I agree. Yeah, I, 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 the, the one re reply I would give is that, you know, it's uh, the, the, the goal is to make a, a young person creative in whatever way you can. And art is creative, science is creative, but somehow it gets, it's broken apart into pieces very early on in the educational system. And, and how you uh, keep that together is, uh, is, is somehow lost. So it, it's, it's compartmentalized. And, and you know, as, as somebody who's taught a long time, I know that teaching is, has its limitations and uh, it's an evolving field. And I must say the way we teach physics, even though there's uh, attempts at doing it differently, it's, it's very primitive. And so there's, there's a lot of uh, room for improvement there. So Emily Carr is actually might move out to Triumph and shove Triumph. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, I, I want to first uh, say that evenings like this don't happen very easily. So I want to first thank Ron and Nigel uh, for giving me your time. Um, uh, 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 
uh, again, uh, putting, putting this evening together, uh, uh, Jennifer Gagne, um, Ingrid Koenig, I hope I said that right, and Sean Arden, thank you for your help this evening. <laughs> Um, my team is here uh, collecting everyone's thoughts on camera, um, so this will definitely be available to everyone to watch again. Uh, but I wanted to, on my behalf, this is a dream come true for me. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.